You have been bleeped by the emergency department to come and examine a patient following a motorcycle accident. You are informed that he has a visibly deformed lower right leg with exposed bone. How would you proceed in this situation? I have been called about a trauma patient with a suspected open fracture. I would want to review this patient immediately. This patient's condition sounds critical, so I would make sure that a trauma call has been put out and I would mobilize the trauma team. On arrival, I would initiate the ATLS protocol by first moving the patient to a resuscitation bay, before commencing the primary survey. I would first assess the patient's C-spine and would mobilize this using the collar, blocks, and tape triple protection method. I would then assess the patient's airway. If they are able to vocalize clearly, then the airway is patent and I would move on to breathing. I would recheck the patient's respirate and saturations before closely examining for chest wall deformity, open wounds, rib fractures or tracheal deviation. After palpating, percussing and auscultating the chest, I would request an arterial blood gas before starting this patient on 15 litres of high-flow oxygen via a non-rebreather mask. Moving on to circulation, I would assess for hemodynamic compromise by measuring the pulses, blood pressure and capillary refill time. Specifically, I would be weary of any blood on the floor and would closely assess the chest, abdomen, pelvis and long bones as potential sites of concealed hemorrhage. If any major bleeding is identified, I would escalate the major hemorrhage protocol. I would ensure that this patient is placed on continuous cardiac monitoring and would establish IV access using two wide ball cannulae in both antecubital fossae. I would take a panel of bloods including a group and save and cross match as this patient may require a blood transfusion, a full blood count, renal profile, clotting and lactate. I would start this patient on IV fluids and would ensure that a urinary catheter is inserted. Once the circulation is stable, I would then move on to assess the patient's GCS, pupils, and glucose level and would request a CT head within one hour if any risk factors were identified. Finally, I would expose the patient maintaining dignity and normothermia and would complete a log roll of the patient to look for any other wounds or injuries. Once the primary survey is complete, I would initiate the secondary survey by closely examining the affected limb, and would look, feel and move the right leg and would also assess the neurovascular status. I would take an ample history from this patient. For completion, I would consider a CT trauma series and a fast scan to exclude other serious injuries, and would request an AP and lateral radiograph of the right limb to include the joints above and below the injury. I would optimize this patient for theatre by making them nil by mouth and would also consent, mark and book this patient. Definitive management would be in accordance with the BOST guidelines and would initially involve reducing the fracture, starting IV antibiotics within one hour, photographing the wound, giving the patient a tetanus shot, and reassessing the neurovascular status. If the neurovascular status is intact, I would escalate this patient to my registrar as an urgent case for CPOD theater. If the limb appears to be neurovascularly compromised, this would require immediate surgery and I would escalate further to involve the orthopedic, plastics and vascular teams, as well as my consultant, the CPOD team and the theatre coordinator. What classification system would you use to categorise open fractures? Open fractures are classified using the gastillo anderson classification, which divides them into three types based on the size of the wound, degree of soft tissue damage, bone and soft tissue coverage, contamination, comminution, and vascular compromise. Type 1 open fractures are mildly contaminated, with a laceration measuring less than 1 cm in size, and minimal soft tissue damage. Type 2 fractures are moderately contaminated, with a laceration measuring between 1 to 10 cm, moderate soft tissue damage, adequate bone coverage, and minimal comminution. Type 3 fractures are further categorized into A, B, or C subtypes, and are often found to have a laceration greater than 10 cm, extensive soft tissue damage, severe contamination or comminution, or vascular compromise. What are the signs of neurovascular compromise? The features of neurovascular compromise can be remembered by the six Ps. On examination, the limb would be pale, pulseless, 
perishingly cold, and painful, with paresthesia and paralysis. A patient with severe pain which is out of proportion with their presentation, specifically on passive stretching, should raise your suspicion of compartment syndrome.